We now have the pleasure of being joined by former four-time All-American Syracuse men's lacrosse player and now the head coach at Bergen Catholic in New Jersey. It's Rick Beardsley. Rick, how are you doing on this Thursday morning? I am doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. Sorry we've uh, had some scheduling conflicts. It's just the life of a dad who's living by himself with an oldest child here in um, Hohokus, New Jersey, while the other one is not too far from you with uh, my wife. So uh, it's just a little nuts. I'm, I've learned to appreciate the things my wife did that I didn't do. Well, we're glad to have you here now. Let's talk about Syracuse men's lacrosse. It's been an interesting season in year two under under Gary Gate. And I know as a, as a fan watching this team and as an alum of the group, just what are your impressions of the team six and four right now through 10 games? I mean, I think you can see the youth, right? But you can see the youth, like, as I always said, right? Uh, a freshman is not a freshman at the end of the season. And you can see the youth building up. It's also a very tough schedule. Uh, there's really no cupcakes. Um, I think they're doing well. I don't think they're very deep on defense. Uh, it's not anything against them. It's just they're not very deep, right? And and one key injury hurts a bit. But, you know, in defense, guys, so you know, it, you can hide those injuries, right? Because it's about the support, right? In football, for example, it's how many helmets you float to the ball. So if you, you do your job and, and, and stay within your rules or within your system, you can have relative, you know, good success. Offensively, it's very different, right? That requires a little bit more of a skill set of passing the ball around, cutting, moving, being creative. Um, but six and four, I think lax numbers, whoever that is on uh, social media, picked uh, Syracuse to win 5.5 games. They've already hit that number. I wish I bet it myself. Um, and they have a tough schedule going forward. Yeah, they have five straight games against ranked opponents. You mentioned a bunch of the freshmen. They're a very young team. What were your expectations kind of coming into the year with the young squad? I mean, for me, I knew a lot of those guys. So I'm pretty fortunate in what I do for a living, which is I, you know, I'm in the apparel industry and, and I, it allows me to sell to a lot of lacrosse teams. So in a lot of clubs. And I'm also, by many people's standards, apparently a pretty decent lacrosse coach. So I get asked, to go to a lot of the big showcases where the best players are. So I have seen a lot of these guys. I also have personal connections, obviously. Uh, people think it's always the Joey Spolina connection with Big Joe and I, and uh, my oldest daughter, Angela, committed to Stony Brook. Uh, she's a junior. Uh, it's really actually goes deeper than that. Billy Dwan Jr., Billy Dwan Sr., the Dwan family grew up in my hometown. My mother cut their hair, you know, all the guys' hair. I mean, from Timmy to Mr. Dwan to Mrs. Dwan. So I've known BD, young, you know, old BD, old man BD for a long, long, long time. And Billy Jr. I've gotten a chance to know and see. I've had, you know, Nick Kakamo in my clinics, Michael Leo, I've had it all a host of events. Um, I've gotten a chance to see a lot of the guys. So, you know, my personal connections are, are very different. I know a lot about their families because, you know, I just been around a lot and I'm really fortunate that now my, my, you know, that our kids, Tori and our kids are, are starting to get in that realm of, of, uh, of college athletics themselves. And, uh, you know, so for the youth there, it's been, um, you know, it's been a, a roller coaster. I think they're learning every day. I think that the games they've lost tight games come down to a few things, right guys. That's what they say, right? These are the coaching types of things you learn. When you go into an overtime game, they say it's coaching. It's either coaching or, or senior leadership, right? I don't know if it's, I don't think it's coaching to be honest. I mean, you have some guys that aren't green in the coaching realm, coaching realm, and they're doing a, a, a stupendous job right now with, with a rebuild because Syracuse lacrosse. So, you know, guys is on a very much a rebuild. It is not a team that is, or a program that is where everybody wants to go like it used to be. So I think, you know, Gary, uh, you know, Dave Petromal on the defensive end. I think Pat March on the offensive end. Um, they're they're doing a good job. I mean, adding Will Mark doesn't hurt, but I do think that senior leadership is the big thing they lack. Um, and I'm not, that's not at all a negative point at seniors. It's just the majority of the guys that play are underclassmen. So if those seniors aren't on the field. How can you lead? 
Right. I was I was going to say the thing with Gary is it seems like he's building the program, but it's just going to take time. You're not going to get immediate results because this team doesn't have that that senior leadership like you talked about. So do you foresee Gary, be, Gary being able to get these guys that are now freshmen to become those senior leaders you're talking about? Yes, I do. I mean, listen, it's really hard to be a coach in Syracuse, New York. OK, if you're a college coach. Look at case in point, Coach Behan. You know, he's had a couple of years, but this year there was, you know, media scrutiny and a lot of things, and and it becomes a very big deal, correct? You guys are, you know, out-of-state guys. You're understanding, or downstate guys, you're understanding a small market and how it, you know, it influences uh, a lot of things. And it doesn't matter, small market, big market, they say New York, LA, it's tough to play there. It's tough to play at Syracuse in, in the in the big three, right? It's tough to play football. It's tough to play basketball and it's tough to play lacrosse. Um, I, I think they're meeting the expectations and, and what we're expecting right now based on what ACC lacrosse and what lacrosse is in college in general. I, I have the privy of living down here. So I get a chance to watch a ton of lacrosse and there's a really a lot of good teams and there's a lot of good players from now all over the country. And there's a lot of facilities that are actually nicer than Syracuse's facilities are. So Syracuse has really not become that destination for everyone. I mean, Jacksonville, I mean, guys, you know, the deal, it snowed yesterday there. It's I wore, I haven't worn pants here in New Jersey, which is a short trip of three hours South in like, honestly, 10 days. So imagine being in Jacksonville, you know, and imagine as the programs grow and the amount of players get better, what you can do all year round with training facilities and, and, you know, the money being spent. So yes, Gary is in a rebuilding stage and he will continue to build it to what he wants. Um, so obviously they're rebuilding. They have a chance though, at the five game stretch all against really tough teams you just need to be above 500 to qualify for the NCAA tournament. So how do you kind of see the team finishing out the rest of the year? Well, I'm going to tell you right now, they better buckle up, pull their shorts up and jump on in to head first. Uh, I think the, the one thing that they're going to need to do is to go into the games like they have nothing to lose. They certainly have enough talent. Do they have enough depth, Right. Uh, they run into some good teams. I mean, there's top fives. I mean, and then you have Princeton, who pretty much, I mean, destroyed a very good Yale team. So I think that it's going to be a rough go to get to 500. I do think if they get to 500, they do deserve a nod into the NCAA tournament simply because of strength of schedule. I do think they're getting a shun every week in the top 20. I often, sorry, guys, I know you'll be media guys when you're older. I, I'm, and you'll probably be some of the best. I'll probably be very happy that, I, oh, my God, I was on his. I used to be on his. Like, I mean, I, I really know that about you guys because I have kind of been in the media a few times where I've done ACC Network games, done a stupid lacrosse show there in Syracuse for years, and I often get interviewed. But, you know, it is going to be – uh, very interesting uh, moving forward. But like I, when it comes to the rankings, like I look at like inside lacrosse, no, nothing against them. Like what the hell do you know? I, I mean, Syracuse is definitely a top 20 team. USILA top 20 team. Like you're telling me that Syracuse can't beat Delaware. Like I, I'm being, I'm not even being mean here. Uh, it's just not. Uh, um, I love Ben DeLuca, the head coach. He's the old Cornell guy. I played against him. I'm friends with him. I sell to them. But I mean, just that alone. I mean, be you. Come on. Like, of course they can play with those guys and they can and they can beat them. But for them, for 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 Syracuse to keep getting shunned guys is absolute. So how do you think what is it? What does this team then need to prove to get back in the well, like if they haven't gotten back in the rankings yet, what do you think it's going to take for them to get back in the rankings? Just winning, if anything. It's gonna be winning one of those five or two of those five and having tight games and not, you know, taking it 
terribly like they, you know, in an embarrassing way against UNC. And you guys are all smiling because I'm a freaking media guy's dream because I talk a ton and I speak my mind. So, and I, I don't fear the conflict. I, I mean, the truth is, guys, it's going to be a rough road, but it's definitely deserving. But the tournament only has 12 teams. So, it, it, or is it 16? It's 16 teams. 16 yeah, teams. I think it's 16, yeah. It's going to be rough to get in, but I do think – you win one of those games, you keep it close in all of those games. And, you know, you do some good things. And then we'll see how the RPI shakes out. But again, they have to qualify. That's the whole key. There's so Listen, Notre Dame could have been the second or uh, the third best team in the country last year. And due to their ACC schedule, they didn't get in. I mean, it's basically the same team as last year that they have this year with like one or two more pieces added. So... It's really a crapshoot out there uh, uh, for Syracuse. But if they don't come into the games with with the attitude of, like, I have zero to lose, they're going to lose. I actually had a question pop into my head when you were talking about the personal connections that you have with a couple of the players. Do you have a favorite one or two players on the current roster right now? Oh, my God. It's so simple. I mean, Joey Spelina, like, is – I love Joseph. I, I mean, I really do. A lot of people, I, I'm very privy, right, with with my age, uh, my career, the business I'm in, to be around all this. And, you know, Joe, you know, Joey is a really great young man. That's what people, they see a great player. They didn't give him a chance. By the way, what I can't stand about this world, and I'm a parent, and I'm almost 50. I know I don't look at guys. I'm a straight stud. I know these things. But not you don't look a day over 40, Rick. Exactly. Thank you. Smart answer. Because if I could, if you said 55, I'd reach through the zoom right through you on you. So it wouldn't be a problem. But that being said, the truth is, uh, you know, not a lot of people get a chance to see that side of Joey. And I and I'm lucky that I do. I mean, he is without a doubt my favorite, not because his dad's gonna coach Angela Beardsley at Stony Brook, and I need him to make sure she plays. And it's, it's not that I, I've Angela, you know, I've known big Joe for 30 years. I known Joey since he was young. I mean, when we're in Lake Placid, which is obviously a big thing, we get an opportunity. Our families eat dinner all the time. And I still talk to big Joe. I still send things. I would have to say that the, the part of my heart is with, is with Joey. And then I would have to say, because of the Yorktown ties, my guy BD jr. Um, you know, I'm very lucky where I've lived in Syracuse for 30 years until I moved here uh, this past year. And, and, you know, it's a bit, it's a small town, right? And there's lots of connections you have. And I'm able to help those guys if, if God forbid something happens and, and point them in the right direction for good food, good times and, and do, uh, you know, whatever else they need. So I would say, I have to say, you know, Joey is one of my favorites. Um, and BD is one of my favorites as well. Uh, he's a very different character. Doesn't talk much, as you guys know. When you interview Bill Duan Jr., he's he's very big in stature and 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 small in 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 the chatter. Uh, but Joey is one of my favorites. I think I've ever been around in the sport as a young lacrosse player, and and I mean that sincerely. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Like All jo- getting to interact with Joey just from a, a media yeah. standpoint, he is he is very, very, very just a really nice guy. Uh, the only Ooh. the only the only questions you have with him is sometimes he's wearing a Dodgers hat. Sometimes he's wearing a Yankees hat. He's playing both sides of the baseball diamond. Well, hold on bit. a second. You're wearing a Mets. So I'm a Mets guy. Mets, Jets, Nets. Always yep. had been going to admit it. OK, my father was one of the first 5000 season ticket holders for the Jets. He got a job at Con Ed when he was 18. They went from the Titans to the Jets. He's like, it's pretty cheap. Why don't I buy them? And boom. Hence, we became Jet fans. And they were horrendous for years. And they <laughs> and and the Mets, it was easy. You know the deal. If you're from Westchester, you're Yankees or Mets, right? It's, it's yep. a simple way of going. But the Nets, I've lived in New Jersey for so long. I used to love the Knicks. And it's just, I used to go to Net games. Um, like, everybody likes the Rangers and, and the Islanders on the island. I would say I'd have to be a, a Devils fan. I used to go to Devils games. So, uh, yeah, Joey is, he's a special kid. Not a lot of them come along in the generation and, and, and hopefully his career 
right? It continues to what people, you know, have said it's got to be. And, you know, after the first game, I loved it when he went one for 14. Because I remember a, a guy by the name of Roy Colsey, if you hit Google with him, he's pretty good, right? He was a four-time All-American Hall of Famer. He's now in the just in the and, and the, you know, professional lacrosse hall of fame just this past week, my college roommate, my guy I grew up with, uh, I was in my wedding party. Um, he went one for 25, one game and still ended up as like the 10th leading scorer and a four-time all American. So I loved it in the beginning when everybody was, was, was counting them out. Cause when you count certain guys out, that's when you see what they're really made of. And so far we've seen what Joey Spelina is made of. Yeah, he he's bounced back in a major way over over the past few games and especially last week. And we wanted to have you on last week to talk a little about Hobart and the Kraus Simmons trophy, as that's oh. a game uh that, that's been played for a long time now and getting to play for you for four years under coach Roy Simmons Jr. What was it like to be a captain of those teams to win those games uh against Hobart? So first of all, I was a captain. Was that's what I, I read. I that's what I read. I think I was. That's what I, I read. Them. Listen to me. I don't remember half the things, okay? And I don't have head trauma. Real quick, I'm watching Penn Syracuse 1993. And I'm watching the game. It's on YouTube. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to watch this game. I remember shredding kids. It's going to be sick. I'm going to, like, get highlights. My kids will say, oh, that's going to be great. Then all of a sudden, I scored a goal. I don't even remember scoring the goal. Like, dude, I'm a D guy. I did have a lot in my career. So that will tell you that's what I remember. Um, Kraus Simmons, the, listen, the Hobart Syracuse game, my freshman year, I, 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 I get a penalty right off the bat and I get hit the, I go right, sit down, take a knee. It's a disgusting day in Geneva, which Geneva's like, it's like months in New York, to <laughs> right? When it rains. So, uh, like it was terrible. All of a sudden, pat, pat, pat. I'm like, what the, I get hit with like three oranges. And then I, as I turn around here, somebody threw a fish. I couldn't believe it. That, no way. No way somebody threw a fish at you on the field. Guys, a fish ended up next to me. Like, I know I'm a, I'm, I know I'm a downstate guy and I'm Italian. I was kind of rattled. But, you know, that was my first introduction. It was literally I got a slash first, like, minute in the game, and that's what I got. And then we, you know, it was a one goal. It, it, it was, I don't know if it was a one goal game. We were losing at halftime. And uh, I remember Tom Marichek went off in the second half, like sick behind the backs. Like we ended up obviously winning. And then we played them two years in the dome and we punished them for those two years in the dome. And then we went back out there my senior year and uh, Lo and behold, another one goal game, but a dude came out of the box by the name of Casey Powell, who was serving like a, like, I don't know what penalty he was served. Probably didn't even get it. Casey really didn't get many penalties. And I don't even think that they knew he was coming out of the box. And he, in Casey's like little, little quick fashion, scored the game winner with 18 seconds left. So Hobart Syracuse to me, like that game, that particular game, I got spit on at halftime. It was a bunch of football players. We were losing two at halftime. So I had the mentality, and I'll admit it, I'm, different, I'm a different cat. So we're walking, and how it works is you left from Boswell Field, you walked into your locker room. You didn't stand because it, it was a terrible day, so you're going to lock. These, all these football players from Hobart were definitely hammered, and, I was, and they were killing everybody because you walk through the fans, and they're like right on you. Like, ah. I said in my head, now, this is where I become the downstate Rick Beardsley and, you know, grow up, like throw a punch before you're going to get hit. I said, one of these guys gets in my ear and chirps. I'm spitting in their face. Literally, I desk coach Jesco behind me. Guys jumps right in my <laughs> spit right in his face. So I'm not going to lie to you. And what, what, did, what, did, Co what did coach Desco do when he, when he saw you? He actually said to me, grab me, he goes, Rick, are you okay? Is everything all right? <laughs> I swear to God, he didn't even like get mad at me. And I and I, I remember coming back in and they were waiting for me. And it was a rainy day and I just went, yeah, yeah, bring it. And they just started spitting all over me. Like, I just took it, honestly. I mean, I gave it out first. I'll be the first to admit it. I gave it out first. And uh, I took it. 
but the whole, but the Kraus Simmons uh, rivalry was incredible because I remember uh, you guys don't know this, but my next door neighbor, growing up, Matt Togler, uh, who lives down in Maryland now, whose son's going to Maryland, um, whose daughter was an All American at Maryland, uh, he was my next door neighbor, and he was a first team All American at Hobart, and uh, he wore number forty seven as well, and I used to watch those games on VHS. Those Hobart Syracuse games, Division Three, Division One, were crazy. So I knew of, you know, the rivalry and all the hoopla behind it, and, and it was awesome. And I was very fortunate to play all four years. Right, I, I'm one of those very few guys that gets a chance to start for four years um, in any generation, let alone be an All American. So I, uh, the the Kraus Simmons, you got you learned more about it as you got older right? As you got into your senior year, the importance of it, of two coach Simmons, because coach Simmons senior died uh, in 1994 during the season. And, you know, that 95 win, you know, was very, was very big and emotional for coach Simmons. Cause if you know, coach Simmons junior, he's a very emotional guy, you know, he's like, and if you don't, by the way, on a sidebar, you know who's the most emotional guy on earth? We call him the Tin Man. Come on, guys. Take oh, a guess. Who? Joe Spalina Sr. <laughs> he Tin Man's it every second. It's so funny. Anytime he, I, he scored his first goal, we were all text him. Joe, congrats, congrats. Yo, Tin Man, did you cry? He goes, I'm crying right now. Like, it's so funny. But, yeah, ask Joe. He's like, does your father cry a lot when, he, when you're honored about something? Does he get excited? He really does. We call a tin man. We call it. So he's like, you know, but, but yes, uh, the Kraus Simmons rivalry. I couldn't believe Hobart actually beat us a few years. I mean, that's kind of, in my opinion, embarrassing, but, but, but again, I'm, I got arrogance, so it's different. Um, so obviously you played all four years. You won two national championships. Your team did in the middle of the 20 year final four run. What was playing on those teams? Like all four years. Oh, I mean, if you really want to know the truth, should have had four national championships. And that's not, we were number one seed in 92, my freshman year. And we took Princeton for granted. They jumped on us six to one. It's very hard to come back and win six to one, even though we took it to double overtime. Uh, but I can tell you, the greatest part about those things were the, were my teammates. Like I have one that coaches with me right now, John Barr, who was a member of the nine, the 93 team was an all American midfielder. He coaches with me here at Bergen. He's a volunteer assistant lives right in Ordell. I get a chance to see him every day. I still, he laughs. I still use drills that coach Simmons and coach Desco had in practice. I still have a typical first 30 minute format that's adjusted towards obviously this style of play, you know, in the modern era. But to, you know, to answer your question, and I'm going to give you, I'm a long-winded guy, so you're stuck with me. Sorry, guys, you asked me to do it. I didn't ask vice versa. I used to go into, like, business meetings. People would hire me because, like, yo, this guy's a national champ. He's, like, whatever. I had a guy one time, and I used to blow it off, okay? I used to be like, yeah, what's it like to win? He said, what's it like to win a national championship? I said, ah, you know, it's, it's good. You know, I, I was sitting at a dinner. It was, like, a high-powered tech dinner. And uh, dude was pissed because he was genuinely interested in what it felt like to win a national championship. So to answer your question, I will answer it very seriously. Those years were incredible until the birth of our children, right? Till Tori walked down the aisle at Hendricks Chapel. Those were the four biggest weekends of my life until that point no pro game no there was no youth game because there was nothing before that it had to be I can still picture my wife who's still so beautiful and I'm so lucky because I'm such an ugly old dude and I can still picture it I would have to say up until that point those were the four most significant things I've ever had in my life how about that one guys Wow, that is uh, that I as I can't I can't relate to that experience of, of any well, of those. You'll but learn to relate to it with other things. Trust of, me. Eventually, so yeah. w when you're on teams with with greatness like that, you're in the middle of a twenty plus year Final Four run. 
Could you feel the level of talent around you in practice every day when you're on the bus, when you're going from place to place? What was it like being around so many high caliber and talented lacrosse players and coaches? I I was, that's a great question. I was so lucky, right. To have been every year. I had a player of the year, a positional player of the year in my starting lineup that I guarded every day. And it makes you better. But then also in the fact you're just the guys, right? Uh, It's like division one athletes typically breed division one athletes, right? It's, it's how it works. Um, We, we actually governed ourselves. Uh, You know, we governed ourselves in practice. And I mean, like I, I, when people, this is a, this is how I can describe it. When you ask me and you say to me, that kid's legit, you know what I think of? Gary Gate. You tell me a defenseman's legit, I think of Dave Petromala or me. When you tell me an attackman's legit, a kid's legit, I think Mike Powell. So I always tell people, please don't say that to me because I think differently. I've been around legends. I've been around Hall of Famers. You know, I've played against them. I've made them look stupid. I've been made stupid. Um, You know, so that's what I think about. So to be around those guys, you know, I'll be honest, I never really, I never really thought about it till now. I, I can tell you this, I had a driver's seat to some of the greatest goals in Syracuse history. And I, I'll use the explicit. I don't care. I mean, I watched Tom Marichek dunk one from the side, his first goal in, of, of the 92 season. I was a freshman. I'm on the other end. I'm like, oh, my God, that was sick. Like, where am I? There's 18,000 people here. This is awesome. I, I mean, I, I, I often, the euphoria that I felt running the ball down on my first clear in that game, I don't know what the euphoria, I haven't felt it really ever since, if that makes sense. Like, if that's what drugs are like, sign me up for it, because I would have been all over it. Uh, That's really the truth. So I would have to say that you're right. Every single day, man, I was really, really, really blessed to have worn a Syracuse uniform, to have gotten given the shot to prove myself after, you know, I, I basically (laughs) my freshman year in the fall, you know that, right guys? I've, I haven't heard the story. Yeah. Give us a, give us a little, I didn't live, dude, guys, I didn't literally (laughs) like, come on. Okay. So what happened? I've, I can't believe you didn't do your research. What the hell is this? This is the (laughs) Ostromath podcast. I, right. So All right, my go ahead. Year, I come in, I'm highly touted. I'm like the guy. I'm like, oh my God, I'm sick. I'm big, I'm strong, I'm stud. The ladies love me, girls adore me, right? So like, they didn't actually. But going, I go into my first practice. I earn my way onto the starting lineup. I go to our first scrimmage. It's against Loyola at Loyola. I'm guarding Kevin Beach, six foot six, 230. I'm 5'11", 195, like 200, haven't, Got under a bench press at this point in my life because I didn't think I needed it. I was Rick Beardsley, total stud G. I'm starting to accuse. Well, what do I do? He runs by me for six straight goals. Like, literally, like, it wasn't like, yo, off ball shot, fast break. He finishes on the end. It was, come on, little guy. And I'm crawling all over this mountain. I'm beating the sh- Let me t- Let me just take a step back. I'm thinking I'm beating the sh- It's like I'm swinging a toothpick trying to hit a Mack truck and he lit me up. And I went from being right at the top of that depth chart to rock bottom that next day, just like that. Boom. I went to the 12th D guy and I earned my way back up slowly and slowly to the fourth D guy by the end of the fall. And that was the most humbling experience I've ever had at Syracuse university in all of my existence. And it was one of those things that you just never, you never forget. And I think it helped drive me to that point every year to where like, holy shit, yo, you got to get in shape or 
you got to start hitting the gym. And uh, you got, listen, you can't be eating an entire pizza after coming home at 2 a.m. Um, you know, you better, you better not eat the whole pizza. Just come home. I mean, so you're aware, guys. I can't lie to you. I did go out before every game. I admit it. I, I admit it. I don't even try to deny these things. This is, this is the difference between me and those dudes that are in the Hall of Fame. Not many have a resume like me, but why am I not in the Hall of Fame? We could contemplate that for years. It's probably due to the fact that like in 1995, I was out the night before the national championship and I sent a round of drinks to the USILA executive committee that was across the bar for me. And I'm playing the next day. So guys, that's, 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 that's me in a nutshell. Sounds like a great thing to do to me. I mean, oh, um, I had fun. <laughs> um, so obviously you have all of these experiences as a player. How did these experiences um, for all four years kind of help you as a coach when you transitioned into that, into that realm? Well, I definitely, it was very tough when I first started coaching to not understand that those guys weren't me. Okay. Like I would say like, dude, I don't understand why you can't guard that guy. Like, dude, he's going to Cornell. They suck. Like what the hell? Freaking rip the dude over the head. Look at him. Seven checks on him. It, you had to take yourself away. But the things I learned throughout my career at Syracuse were amazing. It was a few things. Biggest thing was consistency. Have consistency in your, in your practice plan. Have consistency to what you're doing, at least for the beginning. Also have trust in your players. You know, Coach Simmons empowered all of us. Okay, I don't have captains on any team that I have ever in my life coached because I do feel that my worst player should be treated as equal as my best player. When my worst player has the ball, he is just as valuable as the best player with the ball. And that should empower him. So I try to give empowerment that way. Uh, another great thing I learned was let kids play. I play in a very chaotic type system here. And chaos can hide imperfections, which all of us have. College kids and high school kids alike are going to make mistakes. And the ball will go around, say, three times. And the ball goes out of bounds. You just wasted that time and, and a chance to, to have a possession. Why not push the pace, right? Put them back on their heels. Coach Simmons always taught us to throw the first punch. And, and, I, and I've, I've gotten in a few scuffles in my day, and I've always thrown the first punch. Um, and, and the one real biggest thing that I learned that is that, that I've been in every situation. There's nothing that rattles me. Like people, I'll, I, you know, I, sometimes I reach a level of intensity that is very understandable, under, very not understandable for a lot of people. But it's, I'm always totally in control. I can come out of it in seconds. That really is not even an arrogant statement. It's a very factual statement. And what that's allowed me to do I have been in the national championships in double overtime. I've been in the regular season games where it's packed. I've been in the final fours. I've lost them. I've won them. I've lost national championships. I've never once been in a game and been felt like, I, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's really attributed to my career at Syracuse. I never have a panic. I don't press the panic. I never press the panic button ever. I've never pressed it. And, you know, I, I've, I pressed a button that where you got to turn the kids up to get them going. But in my coaching career, that has been the most useful thing that I think I have over others, right? My resume may not be the wins and losses. I mean, I'm, I still, I have a pretty good coaching resume, but where I differentiate myself is I think I'm more of a player's type coach. I understand that guys, you know, kids are degenerates down deep. They are, I know it. Don't worry, you guys probably were out last night, dirty stay outs. I don't even want to see your Snapchats. But here's the deal. I understand that. Okay, I understand that. And 
if that's being wrong, then I want to be wrong for a long time. And uh, I think I get the most out of my kids because that's what Coach Simmons got out of us. He trusted us. We had guys in the lineup that no one wanted, including me. Like, dude, I'm a handful. And he dealt with it and let me be me. And hence, look at the highlights. Like, go, you could, honestly, I'm going to say it. You could go back and look at games. I threw behind the backs 30, 40 yards. Why'd I do it? Just because I wanted to. These kids nowadays, they throw behind the back. It's 50 million views on Instagram. It's like, dude, go back. I threw lefty, righty. I shot behind the back, like my freshman year, like four times, like pole goals. Holy shit, pole goals. whoop de doo I had pole goals my whole life. Like, you know, but again, again, I'm not, it's not, it's not an arrogant statement, guys. It, it's, it's truthful. So that's really what I learned, man, was those, those three things were so big that have carried over to my coaching career. I think that's a perfect way to, to close things up is, is you talking about your coaching, Rick. But before we let you go, do the Orange get it done this weekend against the former, you know, the Irish were the number one team in the country. They fall into number three. Do they, do they get it done the rest of this regular season and, and get back to the postseason? Well, as you know, I always have a story, guys. Who did I eat dinner with on Tuesday night in Westfield, New Jersey at the Brick Oven? None other than Randy Wojcik, Dr. Randy Wojcik, who is the brother of Chris Wojcik, the Notre Dame offensive coordinator, the former head coach of uh, Harvard. I sat down, had dinner with those guys after our Westfield scrimmage. Didn't take the dub, by the way. And uh, I will say this. If... Whoever wins that face-off battle has got a really good shot of winning that game. The Kavanaugh brothers are so good, it's disgusting. So the, the, the amount of times the ball doesn't touch them would be good. So I'm going to say Syracuse does have enough to get it done every game. I mean, gr granted, guys, I bleed orange, so it's tough for me to say they can't. But I do think it's a one-goal game. I think they, I don't even look at the spread. Yastrzemski sent me his spreadsheet with the spread. I don't even know what the spread is, but I would go on Syracuse either winning it or they get thumped. It's going to be that simple. Uh, no in between. There's no in between. And I will tell you the X factor is literally at the X. And the big thing that Syracuse really has going for is Will Mark is playing outstanding. And he's out. And I think the ball's got to touch Joey Spillina more. All right. Thank you so much, Rick. Your stories, your knowledge is, it was unbelievable to listen to. And it, it was just a pleasure that we, that we got to do this and finally sit down. There it is. The thumbs up like Chuck Norris, when they say in the last one, a dodgeball, Chuck Norris. <laughs> That's Rick Beardsley, everyone, head coach of Bergen Catholic and former Syracuse, all American.